Um, Jack runs a, a fascinating research program. He is uh, science famous for discovering a group of poisonous birds in remote Papua New Guinea. Um, but he also uh, has, for example, described new mammal species from Namibia. He does regular field work in the Sierras, looking at the impacts of fire on ecosystems. And he's also uh, developed and leads a master birding course here with the Audubon Society. So Jack is personally responsible for a lot of the bird nerds you see walking around the Bay Area, you know, with their binoculars attached to their face. Um, and so the last few years, Jack has been studying the genomics of hybridization to understand its impacts on our local owl species. And he's gonna tell you more about that today. Um, so if you could mute your microphone so uh, you don't interrupt his talk. And at the end of it, if you would like to ask questions, we'll take a few and you can just add a question mark to the, uh, to the chat and I'll call on you afterwards. Um, and so let's go ahead and begin and welcome Jack. Do we clap in this virtual? <laughs> I don't know. No need to clap. <laughs> welcome Jack. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's, it's great to be here. I'm so glad you guys are keeping this format going and, and keeping the seminars going. It's been wonderful to be able to tune in once a week and, and hear from some of my colleagues. So today I'm gonna to talk about a, um, a research project or a program um, that I've been involved with for, for quite a few years. And I'll talk a little bit about how I first got involved um, and, it's, and it really has to do with, with northern spotted owls, which are protected in, um, in the western United States. And although I'll be talking mostly about owls, the situation that they're facing is really not unique to them. And I'm hoping to challenge you a little bit to think deeply about, you know, what it means to be an animal lover and a conservationist in, in this world and, um, and some of the difficult decisions we're sometimes forced to make. So. Um, let's get started talking a little bit about, you know, what is the northern spotted owl? So it's this, it's this beautiful owl that we have here um, in California, and it's found from the coast of, of um, in Marin County all the way up into British Columbia. It's a medium-sized owl, about 18 to 19 inches. Um, it weighs um, about 24, it weighs about 17 to 24 ounces. It's chocolate brown with spotting on the head and, and neck and back and underparts. Like most raptors and other owls, the male is smaller than the female typically. Um, and this particular species is restricted to areas with large thick forests, mostly with older stands. Um, they roost in cool shady spots and they usually need some very big trees, uh, some, and typically some old growth um, in their nesting core. Um, but they're usually recognized by their call. So if you're out in the, in the woods, the best way to encounter them is by listening to their call. And they have a four note hoot that sounds something like this. Ooh, 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 ooh. And so if you hear that, you know that there's a spotted owl nearby. Um, there are three different subspecies of spotted owls. Um, and they are um, the Northern spotted owl, which is shown up here, the California spotted owl. And let me see if I can get, um, my pointer going. Here we go. So the, the northern spotted owl is found from British Columbia um, down to the northern California border and then down the coastal ranges into Marin County. The California spotted owl is found in the Sierra Nevada all the way down to southern California and then back up the coast ranges. And the Mexican spotted owl is found in the Sky Islands uh, in the desert southwest and all the way down into Mexico. And interestingly, both the northern spotted owl and the Mexican spotted owl are both listed as endangered at the moment. California spotted owl is not currently listed, although there's constant petitions to do so. They forage mostly at night and they're sit and wait predators. So they'll sit up in a tree in the dark and listen for small rodents scurrying around. So most of their diet, over 90 to 92% of their diet is dusky footed wood rats and Northern flying squirrels and other small mammals. Um, although they take a variety of different prey and they can even hawk and capture bats and insects on the wing. So a little bit of history and if, any of you are old enough like me to remember this, this was a, a really contentious listing. And they were listed as threatened under the, the Endangered Species Act in 1990 due to population declines and due to destruction of critical habitats. And just to give you a, a little idea of, of the declines that they were facing, um, before their listing, uh, a bunch of demographers had done work on spotted owls and, and collected information about them. And the annual rate of population change, this parameter that we call lambda here, ranged from different areas from 0.82 to 0.984. Now, if lambda is equal to one, 
that means that the population is stable. It's neither growing or declining. Anything under one is a population in decline, and anything over one is a population that's growing. Okay, and um, just to map this, you think about how how your own bank account accrues interest. Okay, and if there's no interest, it's at it's at 1.0, and anything that's less than that is losing. And so this is this is basically with those different parameters what you can expect to see after 30 years so the very best performing populations had a lambda of about 0.984 which means that they're losing about 1.6 percent of the population each year so after 30 years that means that they would be down to about 60 percent of the original population size the the poorest performing um, populations had a lambda of about 0.82 which means that they're losing almost 20 percent of their population each year and you can see that you know those populations would go extinct at around 30 years so um, they're going to lose their populations very very quickly and um, and even the average um, was only somewhere around here such that over 30 years we would be down to 30 percent of the of the uh, spotted owls that we started with and so this was really alarming um, to folks and so that was one of the reasons that they were listed so um, so they were listed and everything seemed to be hunky-dory. They, they came up with the Northwest Forest Plan uh, in order to, to manage the forests to protect not only spotted owls, but also marbled murrelets and, and other things and trying to protect some of that old growth forest. But by 2003, um, there were folks from the industry that brought a lawsuit that challenged the listing for two different reasons. One, because populations were still in decline in spite of the halted logging. Um, and in spite of all of the Northwest Forest Plan, um, and so this might sound like convoluted log uh, logic, but basically what they said was that, hey, this isn't working, so you should let us go ahead and, and recut those forests because clearly it wasn't our impact that's causing the, the spotted owls to decline. The other reason why they had the review is because some genetic data questioned whether the northern spotted owl was actually a valid subspecies. And so, and also under the Endangered Species Act, uh, there's a ruling that every five years, every species has to be reviewed to see if it still belongs on the endangered species list or not. But in practice, uh, US Fish and Wildlife Service and Forest Service simply don't have the money to do that. And so you basically have to sue them um, to get that review to take place. Well, that happened. Uh, and in 2003, a review took place. And here's what the demographic data looked like. There were 12 different or 13 different study areas. Uh, 12 of those had declining populations and the mean lambda for all eight northwest forest plan areas um, was about 0.976 so you can see that that's declining quite a bit so that still you know over 50 years or so um, you can expect to be again down to about 30 percent of the population and those other areas that weren't under the northwest forest plan were in decline even greater with a lambda of about 0.942 so you can see that this is, you know, basically the same situation that they started with um, when they were listed almost uh, 13 years earlier. Um, and um, I, I should say, too, that I was brought onto the panel uh, as a geneticist to look at the genetic data. But all of the scientists on the panel, and there were, there were about 15 of us, had to look at everybody else's reports and critique everybody else's reports and try and understand what was going on. So a piece of data that the ecologists were looking at um, was this increase in another owl called barred owls. And these barred owls are from the eastern United States, but some of them had made their way out to the western United States. And around 1980, their numbers began to really grow exponentially, uh, so that around 1990, um, they were just really skyrocketing, and the number of new territories was growing really greatly. And some of the biologists were saying, hey, it, maybe these barred owls are really impacting the spotted owls. Another thing that, that, um, that people were looking at was the, the biologists were bringing in data that looked like this. And they were finding that when barred owls appeared on the habitat and began to increase, spotted owls were decreasing. Okay, so it looked like there was this correlation. In places where the barred owls had arrived earlier saw this decrease in spotted owls early. And in places where barred owls arrived later, we're seeing it later. So it seemed like a tight correlation. But, you know, correlation doesn't mean causation. And so we still didn't know at that point whether the, the barred owls were causing the spotted owls to, to decline or whether spotted owls were declining on their own for some other reason and, spotted, and barred owls were just filling in that extra habitat, if you will. And so that became a really critical question 
in that review. And, um, and so basically, the opinion of the panel was divided on the effects of barred owls. So even though we saw this, this sharp correlation, there wasn't enough data that really made the scientific case that barred owls were affecting spotted owls directly. But in that report, we all wrote that the major threats to northern spotted owls at this time include the past effect and the effects of past and current harvest, loss of habitat to fire, and barred owls. And there were some other minor threats as well, but these were the major ones. And so this really heightened our awareness of barred owls and, and made us question what's going on. And so I want to introduce the barred owl to you. So who are these barred owls? Um, so again, it, it's in the same genus. It's Strix varia. Um, they're large chocolate brown woodland owls, about the same size, just slightly, slightly larger. They're ecologically similar to northern spotted owls. Uh, they're a little bit more aggressive than northern spotted owls, not quite as tame. Uh, they prefer mature and old growth forests, typically of mis mixed deciduous coniferous composition. And they're primarily owls of the eastern United States. So if I go back to my very first bird book from 1983, my golden field guide, this is what it shows the range of barred owls to be. And in fact, before that, the range was really restricted to the eastern United States. But by, uh, by the year 2000, uh, this species account for barred owl shows the range coming all the way down into California uh, and, um, and expanding up here into, into uh, Canada and, and all the way up into Alaska. And if we look at eBird records from just two days ago, we can see that barred owls are all the way down uh, to Marin County and throughout the Sierra Nevada, all the way down to Bakersfield. They've been seen that far south. So they're really expanding and, and growing quite a bit. And not only have they expanded their, their footprint, but if we look at a map of California in the records of barred owls, this is just barred owl records, you can see that they've moved into especially the coastal forests and almost replaced spotted owls in many of these coastal forests. And even if we look at Marin County, which is the furthest south point, so this was the last place that barred owls arrived, and they only arrived here, the first pairs arrived in Muir Woods around 2002, but you can see now that there's, that there's individuals that seem to have territories along the Olima Valley, some in the San Geronimo Valley, um, and also in Mill Valley and down in Muir Woods. So they seem to be um, really moving in and filling up a lot of this habitat. So one of the questions that, that biologists have had was, well, how did they get here? So one of the, the interesting things is, um, if we look at where they are not, these are forest owls. And so the Great Plains, which are shown here, and I should say this is the Hanson um, forest cover of North America data set. So everything that you see in green here is forest, is covered in forests. And so because these are forest owls, you can see that this would be a formidable barrier for the expansion of barred owls. And, you know, and they used to be more in this range. So one of the hypotheses is, is that as, as global climate warmed, this allowed barred owls to move northward and then catch these southern boreal forests of Canada and then move westward across this, this corridor. And you can see that the current range of barred owl almost perfectly matches the Hansen uh, data set. But upon more careful analysis, and Kent Livesey compiled these data um, uh, about, a, about a decade ago now, and he looked at all the different records in various databases, including museum records and, and different accounts of barred owls, and this remains one potential corridor, so the owls may have moved northward and then westward through these forests, but he argues that it's also possible, and especially if you look at some of these dates, it's also possible that some of the forests um, that we've produced or, or made or managed in the Great Plains states may have allowed the owls to, to hopscotch, basically, or leapfrog across the Great Plains and then get into these forests in, in Idaho and Montana and then continue to expand. So there's basically two different hypotheses. One is that they moved northward due to climate change, um, and the other one is that they may have hopscotched um, across, the, uh, uh, across the, the Great Plains here, and probably there due to human habitat alteration. And this becomes important when you start to think about management, because if this is a natural process, maybe we shouldn't be stepping in. Maybe we should just let these owls battle it out on their own. But if this is something that's caused by climate change that we've influenced or something caused by our habitat alteration in the Great Plains states, well, maybe we have a little bit more responsibility to act. So um, 
Another question is, well, how far are they likely to go? And so Talon Peterson and his colleagues did this habitat niche modeling. Many of you in the audience are familiar with this, but in short, basically what you do is you look at all the points where the, where the barred out currently occurs, and then you use data from multiple layers. I think they used about 15 different climate layers. So this doesn't even use forest cover data. It just uses um, data about climate, rainfall, max and min temperatures, things like that. Um, and then they model what areas do barred owls like. And then they took that model and they applied it to the Western United States and said, okay, where are we likely to see barred owls expanding or doing well on the habitat? And as you can see here, it almost perfectly mimics the ranges of Northern spotted owls all the way down to Southern California and up in the Sierras as well as where the Northern spotted owl is. And so their assessment was, you know, it looks like they're gonna be able to expand um, throughout the entire range and they could be a, a threat to all of the spotted owls, not just the northern spotted owl. So, um, so these were some of the things that we were grappling with back in 2004 during that, that review. And so in 2005, a group of biologists all convened in Arcata in Northern California to talk about, well, what do we need to do to, to figure this out? And, um, and we, they proposed a variety of different types of studies that could be done. Um, and some of them were just ecological studies. So trying to go out into the forest and see how the two owls are interacting and what they're eating and how they're reproducing and, and, um, and trying to figure out like how they might be impacting each other. And so we all agree that those were important studies to do, but everyone agreed that one of the critical studies that needed to be done was we need to be able to go in and remove barred owls from some areas and then see how spotted owls respond to the removal. But even our colleagues in, in Fish and Wildlife Service said, but unfortunately we can't do that because owls are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. I was the only museum scientist in the audience and I raised my hand and I said, well, you know, you guys, I actually have a permit to collect birds um, as a part of my general collecting that I do because I'm in a museum. And part of what my job is, is to document um, natural history and birds and mammals that are out there. And I said, if you would like me to, I can use the permit that you gave me. Um, and if you wanted to issue more permits, you could always do that. I said, you know, and, and I, I think it's going to be very important for us to have some record of these barred owls as they move in to understand their biology and, and what's happening. And I said, if you would like to partner up, I can do those removals where you can do the follow-up studies. So I would love to collaborate with you on that. And they all kind of scratched their head and said, yes, let's talk. Let's, let's do that. And so we designed some initial studies, and these were very small studies, removing just a small handful of birds in order to document their movement primarily. But then other biologists were gonna, gonna be out there in the field and measure how the spotted owls responded to those removals. So just a little background about that. The goals are, one, to document barred owls in the Western United States and ask the question, how do spotted owls respond to barred owl removal? And already, even at this time, people were beginning to ask the question, well, you know, if it turns out barred owls are a really big problem, can they even be removed? Is management of barred owls an option? And so the first work that we did was up here in an area called Goose Nest in this little patch of forest in the Klamath National Forest. And I work with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service biologists from the Wairika office. And all the owls, all of the barred owls that we removed had to meet these study criteria. One, they had to be... Um, they had to be paired territory holding and breeding barred owls, and they had to be sitting on territories that were formerly occupied by spotted owls within the last one to two years. And so up in this area, we were able to collect about 11 owl, 11 owl individuals up there. And it became a, a really big um, political issue for, for Fish and Wildlife Service. And they said, you know what, we can't participate in the study anymore but we, would, we want this study to continue. And so they partnered me with a person from the timber industry named Lowell Diller, who worked for a timber company in Northern California called Green Diamond. And at first I was very apprehensive about working with the timber company on owls, especially killing owls on timber company lands. But US Fish and Wildlife Service and Forest Service officials assured me that Lowell Diller is an excellent biologist. He's also a professor at, at Humboldt State. He's highly respected and whatever we find, he will publish, whether it's good for the timber industry or, or not. And we, we trusted him and we started this study and we moved it over to Green Diamond 
where we were able to, to remove 20 owls uh, on an initial study plot on Green Diamond Land. And then, and then Lowell was able to do all of the follow-up work. Um, and I don't want to pull any punches here. I want to, I want to, you know, be open about what's going on. So the way that we do this is we, we go out to the, to the territories where the barred owls are. Um, we call them in using a remote digital caller, this little speaker like thing. And we, we plug in a barred owl call and this causes the, the barred owls to fly in. Um, and when they get in a tree very, very close so that it's virtually impossible to miss them. And this is not a sport. This is removal. We want to do it as quickly and humanely as possible then we remove them with the 12 gauge shotgun. Once we get the owls, we take a variety of field measurements and data. Um, we gathered a lot of data about our effort, how much time we spent, what calls we used, all that sort of stuff. Because we're, we work at a museum, we got full tissues for studies, um, DNA, RNA for most of the individuals, and other data from tissues like liver for environmental contaminants. We tried to take blood samples when the carcasses were fresh so that we could look at avian diseases and malaria parasites, et cetera. Everything that we could get from these, um, we were trying to get. And then the entire carcass was frozen and brought back to the Cal Academy. Once back in the Cal Academy, we made our very traditional museum study skins that look like this so that we can look at, at the, the plumage of the birds, um, take measurements from wings and talons, beaks, all those kinds of things that we want. Um, we we're able to look at the, the open wings. Um, and then we also would, would take all of the stomachs and stomach contents uh, and all of the postcranial material from the inside of the bird, and those were all preserved in ethanol and on the shelves at the Academy for future study. So some of the results, well, first of all, we found that um, we, we charted, again, here, this is uh, the time to the shot, and this is the number of owls, and you can see here that the mean time to remove females is, was only about 52 minutes per bird, and it took about 85 minutes uh, per bird to remove males. So it didn't take that much time. It was actually quite easy work, even though it wasn't very much fun. Um, and then the really important thing was uh, how do the spotted owls recover after the removals? And so Lowell and his team at Green Diamond um, were there to survey the owls and do all their demographic work and then pair that with the data that, that um, or with the information about the owls being removed. So all told for, the, for this study, there were nine territories that met the criteria for removal. And after barred owls were removed, all nine historical spotted owl sites were reoccupied by spotted owls. Some of them within a week that the, the owls came back and began um, calling and defending the territory. Four of the sites were reoccupied by the original resident owls that had disappeared the last year or the year before. Um, and, and some of them were reoccupied by new or unknown spotted owls. But interestingly, new barred owls moved in and displaced spotted owls at three of those sites. So the barred owls came in, kicked out the, the, the barred owls came in and kicked out the spotted owls again, um, and then they were re-removed and spotted owls came back. Our sample size was very low for this, um, but in the removal areas, the spotted owl occupancy um, was increasing, um, but in the control areas, the spotted owl occupancy continued to decline. So that was the smoking gun, you know, that we needed, or I shouldn't say that, that's a bad analogy, but that was the preliminary data that, that really launched this into um, a bigger study. So what we found was that removal was, was feasible. It wasn't that hard, and it wasn't as costly as some people thought that it might be. Um, that the spotted owls did respond favorably, and the number of barred owls did decrease. So we were able to decrease the number of barred owls by doing the removals. Um, even though the fecundity and survival of spotted owls appeared higher, um, you know, it was a small study and new studies needed to be designed. So with this, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service folks, Green Diamond Timber, um, the, the Hoopa tribe nearby, they all designed newer, bigger studies and started to do um, more removals. And at this point, we stepped back. We didn't do any more. We didn't need any more for our purposes for documenting the invasion of the owls. But we did take all the owls that they were bringing in from their studies. So we took all the specimens that, that they were collecting in the field, and we were able to use them in the collections. And, and I'll talk a little bit about, about more, a little bit more about that in a couple minutes. So then the question is, well, do these barred owls actually lead to spotted owl recovery? And so again, this is the green diamond timberlands. Uh, the pink are the untreated areas where no barred owls are removed. The yellow is the treated area where barred owls were removed. They were roughly equal in size 
and equal in stand density and stand characteristics. So there were similar forests. And here's what you see is that, um, and this is this is time on the uh, on the x-axis and occupancy, or that, or basically whether owls were present on the territory. So, so you can see that occupancy is declining. So spotted owls are disappearing basically from from the habitat from 1999 and up to 2009. And then this is where the removal study, the larger removal study, began in 2010. But what you see is that. In areas where barred owls are not removed, spotted owls continue to decline. But in areas where the barred owls were removed, not only did the spotted owls not decline, but they, they began to increase. And so that was the critical data that suggested that it's actually barred owls is the thing that's keeping the spotted owl um, populations at a low level. Um, and around the same time, every five years, uh, a, a group of people from across the range of northern spotted owls collects all of their demographic data and they put out a big five-year review of the status of northern spotted owls. And Green Diamond has been a part of that study for many, many years, as is Hoopa, um, which is this little square. So they all combine their data. And interestingly, um, when they looked at this, and again, this is this lambda. Remember, when lambda equals one, the population is stable. And the only population, the only population that was not in decline in this study was the green diamond treated area where barred owls were removed. Okay, so that not, not only suggested um, that, you know, that barred owls are, are a critical factor here for spotted owls, but that when you remove the barred owls, that the spotted owls can actually begin to increase their population size. So that's just a summary of that. Um, Okay, so that's a little bit about the removal studies, but I also mentioned that there were ecological studies taking place at the same time that we had started the removal studies. So I wanna just um, cover those because I think that they're also very important. So our colleagues, Dave Weens, Eric Forsman, and Anthony, um, they chose this study area um, in, in middle Oregon along the coastal range that they call Veneta. And the study area is about a thousand square kilometers. And they chose this area because when they started, they believed that you know, that this was probably an area um, where there were still a lot of spotted owls and, and barred owls were mixed in probably in about equal percentages. But when they went out and they began the study and actually carefully surveyed the habitat, what they found was shocking to them. So it turned out that there were only 15 pairs of spotted owls remaining and that there were 82 pairs of barred owls on the, the 82 territorial barred owl pairs on the habitat. So that was really shocking. So at this point, the, the barred owls outnumbered spotted owls by, by a huge factor, almost five to one. Um, they did a whole bunch of different studies. So they, they, um, they measured the range sizes in the core. So the, the, the red here is the breeding core for a spotted owl. And this is the, the annual land use. So they have huge land requirements because they eat mostly mammals. So during the breeding season, you know, their home range uh, size is only about 1,500 uh, hectares. But during the entire year, it's nearly 3,000 hectares is what a spotted owl requires. But barred owls require much, much smaller area. So a breeding pair only requires about 500 hectares. And you can see that, you know, there are very many more of them and they're peppered all throughout the, the, the habitat here. So, so they need much less to do well. Um, they also looked at the habitat requirements and found that, you know, even though they like the same habitats, they prefer those old growth, the barred owl is able to thrive and still do very well on, on even suboptimal habitat, scrubby habitat and cut over habitat. And that's really critical because even though, even where timber um, operations have removed a lot of the forest, the barred owl can continue to breed and crank out young. They also looked at, at the diet. So they collected pellets underneath the nests of both barred owls and spotted owls. And many of you see, have probably seen how you can dissect a bird, um, a, a pellet from an owl and see what they've been eating. So they were able to, uh, to characterize thousands and thousands of pellets and diet items. And they confirmed what we already knew about spotted owls was that 95% of the diet of a spotted owl is small mammals. And most of those are uh, dusky-footed wood rats and um, northern flying squirrels with a few other things, mostly a couple of birds and some other stuff mixed in. But barred owls, even though they do 
take a lot of mammals and there's a you know mammals is a huge proportion of their diet 66 percent by count alone um there are a lot of other things in the diet too amphibians reptiles crayfish even fish a lot of insects which was really surprising and even mollusks a lot of things like snails uh, that they got out of streams but there's still a huge diet overlap and when there's more barred owls than spotted owls the barred owls might might still be taking more um, of the uh, of the diet items than than spotted owls over the same uh, the same area, especially since the barred owls have a smaller range. Another thing that they looked at was reproductive output. So spotted owls tend to breed every second year on average, and they usually produce you know one to three eggs per nest, with an average you know a little bit under two. And so. So overall, um, spotted owls were only fledging about 0.31 young per year because they only bred every, every second year. Spotted owls, on the other hand, typically lay between one to five eggs with an average more in line of like two to three. Um, and so, and they tend to breed every year. And so they were cranking out 1.36, you know, almost, um, almost four times as many um, per pair as spotted owls were producing. So they were much more fecund. And when you count up the fact that there's many, many more barred owls on the habitat, they were producing six or more times as many young um, as spotted owls annually. And so, um, and the other thing that was really interesting was that any spotted owl that nested within a kilometer and a half of a barred owl, its nest failed. So there seems to be some impact of having a barred owl in the neighborhood uh, that, that makes it very difficult um, for the spotted owls to have any successful yawn. So if we look at the different ways that they seem to be, you know, that they seem to be interacting, the barred owl's larger than the spotted owl. It's more aggressive than the spotted owl. There's been anecdotal accounts of barred owls attacking and potentially even killing northern spotted owls. Barred owl requires smaller territories. They have a more generalized uh, diet. They're more of a habitat generalist so that they can do well even on even in habitats that spotted owls don't do well. They breed more regularly, they have larger broods, they have greater dispersal. And even in this area, they were outnumbering spotted owls four to one. So it was really a perfect storm. And really what the biologist was was hoping was that there was some something that spotted owls could do better than barred owls. And, and we could latch onto that as a management tool. And this really caused a lot of the biologists to lose a little bit of hope um, for management. So the main threats from barred owls are competition for food and territories, but also direct aggression and interference um, and simply out reproducing spotted owls. But another possibility is hybridization. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple minutes. Another thing that was interesting is, is that as people began to collect data on this, they went back to their older notes and they were finding that it was, it's not just northern spotted owls that are affected by barred owls. Um, at least two other studies have documented that barred owls prey on smaller owls. Um, and others have shown that smaller owls like northern pygmy owl and western screech owl appear to be disappearing when barred owls become abundant. And here's a study on Bainbridge Island, which shows that same correlation that we see with northern spotted owls. But once the barred owls really spike and have a large population, the smaller owls, and this was Western screech owl here, um, began to disappear from Bainbridge Island in Washington. So that became, so it became, you know, a, a bigger issue than just northern spotted owl. It is affecting the forests and the forest ecosystem as a whole. Okay, so now, now let me jump back. So now here at the academy, we have, you know, at this point we had all this, all the owls from these different um, removal studies. And we had well over 200 owls. So what do you do with a whole bunch of owl specimens? So I want to talk about some of the things that we have done because some of these are really important and have informed management. And it's also very rare for us to get, um, one, a large sample size of top predators from any environment. So it's really valuable to, to be able to use those as a proxy for what top predators might be experiencing. Um, the other thing that's really interesting is that it's not a group of, of sick and ill birds that are coming in through wildlife hospitals. These are all healthy birds out in a variety of places. And so 
those are all really important records of what these owls are encountering in their different places in terms of diet, in terms of environmental contaminants, et cetera. So some of the things that we began to do because we had these large samples was one, we've had people come and work on molt patterns in owls. And by looking at molt, and in fact, this is a fascinating picture because if you use ultraviolet light and you shine it on the owl's plumage, um, the newer feathers glow pink and that pink fades with time. These are porphyrin pigments that glow. And so you can see that these are the newest feathers and, and that's a new feather. And then these are some of the older ones. And so you can look at the molt progression, um, but you can also look at, look at the molts and you can begin to figure out um, how to determine young from adult birds based on the, the plumage. And you can also uh, tell males from females. So these are things that have been very important for managers because with that critical mass of a lot of the specimens, um, they can figure these things out. We were also able to do a lot of disease studies. Um, a lot of people were concerned that one way that, one thing that barred owls may be doing is they may be bringing parasites from the Eastern United States that don't really affect barred owls, but then once they get into the habitat, those might be the things that are affecting spotted owls. So we've been paying attention to some of the different um, owl parasites, including doing some studies on um, blood parasites, including malarias, hemoproteus, uh, and plasmodium, um, but also looking at other parasites. And here's a, an, an eye worm. So many of these owls, the barred owls, were coming in with huge infestations of, of worms that would crawl out of their eyes and out of their eye sockets. And, um, and so we've, we've been collaborating with, uh, with some parasitologists from University of Georgia who are helping us identify these and figure out whether they're actually causing any uh, impacts. But we're, we also have um, a huge number of samples that we'd like to, to look up um, or do some virus work and do some virus screening to see if, uh, if the, any of these owls are carrying interesting viruses. Um, every one of these owls comes in with a stomach that's full of its most recent meal. And so we, we've been able to do a big diet study uh, of what the barred owls are feeding on on green diamond and hoopa owls. These are some of the vials that have those. And one of the things that's interesting is, is that when you actually look at the stomachs, we see a lot of things that were not being picked up in the, um, in the pellets. And so, so this is a topic of a paper that, that we're working on right now. Um, and I'll, I'm going to summarize this very, very quickly. But what we found is that in terms of biomass based on stomach contents, mammals might only be 50% of the diet. Um, but the same major players, again, we're seeing northern flying squirrels, Douglas squirrels, dusky-footed wood rats, but with an addition of things like American shrew moles. And in fact, a lot of the owls, when they came in, had, had mud on their claws. And, and it's obvious that they do do a lot of digging. And so they might be taking moles and having impacts on other mammals that aren't used to being depredated by owls. Fully a quarter of the, of the diet um, is composed of birds. And so that's really interesting, including western screech owls and northern pygmy owls. Um, which we've already mentioned, we're seeing a decline in, in some of these forests. But also a large variety of other things, all the way up to ruffed grouse, which are quite large-sized birds. About 17% of the diet is amphibians. And this is something you don't expect at all from, um, from northern spotted owls. But a really broad variety, including coast giant salamander, the dicamptodon. Um, and we even had two that had rough skin newts. Um, and these are pretty poisonous to a lot of other birds and vertebrates. So that, that was interesting. We even published a separate note just on that finding. Um, reptiles, there's a variety of reptiles, including snakes um, that are taken. Up to about 3% of the diet is reptiles. And this was really shocking, but invertebrates, huge numbers. Um, we've, we've found some of the stomach, uh, stomachs of barred owls with, with you know, 30 to 40 shieldback katydids, and lots of other things from forced scorpions to snails, centipedes, caterpillars, um, and even night crawlers. We, in fact, we have some video of them pulling earthworms out of the ground. Um, so so they're, you know, they're able to thrive in places and in forests and in habitats um, where spotted owls don't. And one of the interesting things is just if we compare you know, what the stomachs um, give us versus the, the pellets, um, we get a very different and more complete view of what, what the, these birds are actually eating. So we're working that data up now. Another thing, um, folks had contacted us and said, hey, we'd love to look at the, at the livers to see if, if they're actually being exposed to, to rodenticides. We published a paper um, that, that came out a, uh, a couple years ago um, showing that, that 
these owls are exposed to rodenticides in, in Northern California um, at a pretty high level. And we were able to screen um, about 84 of these uh, owls um, across several years and across different habitats um, to look at exposure rates. And overall, the exposure rate was about 40% in total. So, you know, 40% of, of all these barred owls um, have been exposed to anticoagulant rodenticides, some of them at pretty high levels. And remember, these are the healthy birds that are able to fly in. So the ones that are killed by rodenticides, we, we would never pick those up. So this is certainly an underestimate of the exposure um, to rodenticides. You might expect that this would be the case, especially if, if we're you know, collecting some of these owls near, um, near agriculture, but we weren't. In fact, most of these owls were out in pristine areas where the forests were intact and, and there's no real access uh, to other people. And it turns out that much of this is due to marijuana grows. In fact, illegal trespass grows um, where people go into the forest, they clear a little patch, they grow marijuana, they leave all their trash behind um, and then they harvest the marijuana and leave and leave a real mess out there in the forest. And one of the things that they do is they haul a lot of in pesticides, insecticides, herbicides out there, and they sprinkle it all around the place. And it and it it really creates a problem for for wildlife. And that's becoming better known. And because these owls are top predators, they're a great proxy for what other top predators are experiencing in the habitat. So that's been a really important revelation, and a lot of other people have jumped on this and are doing other studies. So this has been really cool. This, this paper just came out a, a couple months ago and nearly 50% of the owls tested in Oregon and Washington are showing similar exposure to rodenticides. So that's a really important and emerging problem in, in these forests. When we started getting these specimens in, um, this, was a, this was a typical Western barred owl that, we've, that we found in the Siskiyou range, which looks very different from an Eastern barred owl. And we scratched our heads and said, wow, this is, this is really super weird. And one of the questions that we had was, we wondered if, if um, barred owls have been hybridizing um, with spotted owls in the Western United States. You can see that this Western barred owl is a little bit smaller than the Eastern barred owl. Um, it's, it's patterning on the breast, looks more spotted, maybe not as spotted as a spotted owl, but much more than the barring and the barred owl. Um, and it's also quite, quite dark. It's much darker than the, than the barred owl. So, you know, we were really concerned about this um, and, and what this might mean. We had an SSI student a couple years ago that used a variety of different morphological measurements, including color, hue, feather pattern, and then measurements of wings and legs and, and bills and whatnot. And in a principal components analysis, you can see that um, the Western owls are pretty easily diagnosable. And you can tell the, a Western owl from an Eastern uh, barred owl pretty easily. Um, with only a few that are here on the cusp, and especially those in Siskiyou look even more different. They're the ones here in orange. And so we found that that was very interesting, and we wanted to try and understand you know, what, what that might be, why that might be the case. And um, there's several different hypotheses. Well, one is, is, is that uh, barred owls may be hybridizing with spotted owls, so we wanted to investigate that. Um, there may have just been a severe bottleneck and genetic drift um, that basically changed the genetic composition of barred owls in the Western United States. But another possibility is that they just may be adapting to Western forests and becoming more like spotted owls simply because they need to adapt to the, to the same dark forests and be smaller because of the prey, prey size and, and whatnot. So all of these are, pop, are, are different possibilities. And in order to, to test between these, and I'm going to have to speed up a little bit, um, but what we did was um, we used a full genome approach and we wanted to have a spotted owl that we knew had to be a 100% spotted owl. And this is an owl that came into uh, to a wild um, wildlife facility, wild care in San Rafael. Um, and it's been in captivity since 2005 when it was, when it was picked up as a, as a baby. Um, and, it ha and it can't be released to the wild, so it remains one of their program birds, but it's still healthy. And we were able to get a small blood sample and then do a full genome. And so we, we did a genome project. Um, our version one spotted owl genome um, included 90X coverage of Illumina, Paradend reads with a variety of different insert sizes with mate pair libraries. Um, it had 8,000 scaffolds, and the full size of that genome was about 1.26 gigabases. That was published in 2017. But then that was the scaffolding that we needed to do all the different genetic work that we did. 
So here's a study that was published um, a little bit later. This involved 11 spotted owls, um, northern spotted owls in the data set. It included eastern barred owls, five of them, western barred owls, 33 of them, and some of these were the ones that looked like they may be hybrids. We also had two known hybrids that we included in this analysis, and we looked at SNPs that were fixed between one single barred owl from the eastern United States and the, and the northern spotted owl that we had. So we had two individuals that we sequenced at very high coverage, and we, and we basically made a, a VCF file. Um, it had 5.8 million uh, variable um, SNPs that were fixed between spotted owls and barred owls. So that's a huge data set um, and across the entire genome. And what we did was we, we walked across all the different scaffolds using 50,000 50, base pair windows or 50 KB windows. And we basically took whatever, whatever reads aligned um, and then we basically called that, that 50 base pair region by percentage of the SNPs that matched spotted owls versus barred owls. And then we did this across the entire genome. This approach allowed us to use low coverage um, whole genome sequencing. So you can see here that the, the majority of our individuals were sequenced at or below 1x coverage, but this was still a very, very powerful technique. And even at very low genome coverage, we were able to assign all of these owls. Interestingly, what we, what we found is that all of the owls, except for the two known hybrids, fell out as either 100% barred owl or 100% spotted owl on this chart. And so all those weird looking owls that we had were over here and they were all 100% Western barred owl. There was no Northern spotted owl genes in them. So hybridization is not the explanation for those weird looking owls. Um, so then we wanted to look at some of the other possibilities and we're, we, we wrote up a, a, a big paper that included our genome version 2.0 plus 51 high coverage whole genome sequences. And this included um, 11 spotted owls from two subspecies, the Northern and California spotted owls. And I'm not gonna talk really about that data, but that's very important to conservation of Northern and California spotted owls. Um, but it also included 25 barred owls from Eastern and Western populations. Um, several confirmed or potential hybrids, and a new genome assembly that used BioNano and 10X genomics data. So this had a, a, an N50 scaffold size of about 20.5 megabytes, um, megabases for you genome dweebs in the audience. Um, you might be interested in some of those. Um, the mean coverage per genome that we analyzed was about 31.7%, and we used 17 million biallelic SNPs um, in this data set. So one of the things we wanted to look at is the bottleneck. Um, what we found is that northern spotted owl appears to have gone through a pretty severe bottleneck around 50,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. That would have been um, during the last glaciation. And they're on the rebound now, um, but they are rebounding. So there's no recent bottleneck, it's just this, this older one. But if we look at eastern barred owls, there's no real, no real bottleneck that, um, that they've gone through. And western barred owls also, even though they came out to the Western United States and the numbers must have been, or we would think that they'd be relatively small, um, there appears to have been no real bottleneck there. So that's interesting. So it doesn't appear to be drift in a bottleneck. We also did a genome-wide SNP variation analysis using principal components. And this is all of the spotted owls, um, including California and Northern spotted owls. These are our Western barred owls. And these are Eastern barred owls. And the interesting thing here was that Eastern barred owls are genetically very different from, um, from Western barred owls. And that was a little bit shocking to us. We would expect that Western barred owls would kind of be a subset of the genetic variation that we see from the Eastern barred owls, but that wasn't the case. They do appear to be fairly distinct. Um, and then these are all the different hybrids. So these are F1 first generation hybrids that are 50-50, and then these are some back-crossed individuals. And this has allowed us to look at the morphology of hybrids and what the hybrids look like, and that's very important. Um, but we wanted to explore this split here because this seemed very unusual and, and shocking to us. And we can use some genome tricks to, to try and estimate the split time between Eastern and Western barred owls. And when we do this, we find a genetic split on the order of 1,000 to 7,000 years, not the 50 to 100 years um, that was hypothesized based on 
um, earlier maps and looking at records of, of owls in the, in, uh, going across the Midwest. So this was really fascinating because it suggests that Western barred owls are really genetically distinct, that they split some time ago, and that there's probably some other population that we haven't sampled that's either a refugia or that has some of these, these uh, Western barred owl genotypes. So one of the things we'd like to do is, is try and figure out where the Western barred owls actually have come from and try and sample some of that, that range across the Midwest. All right, so now let me fly through the, the finish of this study. So after those original removals, a much, much larger removal study um, was designed. And this included removals from Washington where there are almost no spotted owls remaining, two areas in, in, um, in Oregon, um, including the Veneta study area and another control area and another area in the Klamath, and then also the Hoopa tribe area in Willow Creek in Northern California. So what they wanted to do was very similar to what, um, what was done on in, um, in the Green Diamond Lands, but they wanted to have a much larger sample and they wanted to look across the range and, and really test the idea um, that removals are feasible and that they'll have uh, and that they'll actually aid northern spotted owl. And this might, and now it's because they're thinking, you know, northern spotted owls are really in big trouble. And, you know, all the data that we've looked at to date makes us realize that they're in much worth, worse shape than we ever thought. And, um, and removals is one possibility for management. So I'm going to summarize just what we have to date. So um, as of last October, a total of 2,100 barred owls have been removed from Clay Ellum, the, and the two Oregon coast sites. So pretty, pretty many. Um, and if we look from 2004 um, down to when th these studies were, were started to today, you can see that there's a huge decline. And in, 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 um, in Washington, the, the numbers of owls are already so low that they're only starting with about 25 to 20 owls um, in these two different plots from 2004. But the numbers are down to less than five in both of these areas without a whole lot of effect of the removals, but that's partially because there are no spotted owls left to come back. So you can remove barred owls, but there's no spotted owls to fill in that habitat. So we were all hoping that things would look a little bit better in Oregon. So here's the Clay Ellum site. This is the, um, or I'm um, sorry, this is the Oregon coast site. And they're starting with between 40 and 60 owls from 2004, and they're down to, you know, between um, 20 and 10, but there does seem to be some nice impact of the removals. So the area where removals are taking place, the owls seem to be, the spotted owls seem to be holding their own, but where there are no barred owl removals, the spotted owls are continuing to decline, and now they're down to, to numbers under five. And the last site here is the, is the Klamath site, and again, these seem to be um, declining pretty rapidly. Um, and again, the impacts of removal here, they, the, re the areas where there's removal seems to be a little bit better than where there is no removal, but you know, it's, they're not huge differences um, at this point. But note how many more spotted owls are left as you move um, further south. So that's at least promising that we have, you know, that there are a little bit more, a few more owls further south. So the big question now is, you know, what is the future of, of barred owls and spotted owls? Um, and some of the remaining questions that biologists are wrestling with is, is, is there some habitat type where spotted owls might have the upper hand? Maybe we can manage the habitat. Um, and so there's some study, studies underway to, to try and look at that. Um, one defensible area may be Marin County because there, there still aren't that many barred owls in Marin County. And so the state of California is looking closely at Marin County as a potentially defendable area, but they're also looking at California spotted owl territories all the way down through the Sierras and hoping to try and keep barred owls out of that area. Um, and they're considering management, um, removal and management option. But it's important because by law under the Endangered Species Act, the US Fish and Wildlife Service must identify the most serious threats and figure out ways to address each. And right now, one of the only ways that, that it looks like you might be able to manage this situation is by removing barred owls. And it's a really important case because we really just don't know whether that's going to be a palatable solution, whether, you know, the general public is going to support that ongoing removals of a large, beautiful, charismatic owl in order to save another um, large, beautiful, charismatic owl. But I think it's important for a couple of different reasons. I think one, um, 
you know, this has been done for many other species. And in fact, if you look at the number of birds killed under depredation permits in the United States, um, and this is between 2011 and 2013 alone, hundreds of thousands of brown-headed cowbirds are removed. And in fact, um, between 1972 and 2002, over 125,000 cowbirds were killed on breeding grounds of Kirtland warblers alone in order to try and help save Kirtland's warblers. So, you know, we are doing this, but no one seems to really care because they're not big, beautiful, charismatic birds like owls are. And red-winged blackburns are, are killed with depredation permits, common grackles. And some of you may recall just a couple years ago, um, there was a, a permit issued for double-crested cormorants um, to try and help salmon stocks. And, uh, and a lot of people were very, very upset about that. And, and you know, so how people are going to feel about owls is, a, is another, is a completely um, other question. And another reason why it's really important as, is because as our habitat becomes more and more constricted and there's less and less space that's wild and, and that's natural, um, more and more species are going to come into conflict. And we're going to have to be choosing between one or the other if we really want to manage for biodiversity. The other thing is, is as, as we change climate and we alter habitats, more and more animals are going to be changing the ranges and we're going to see more and more conflicts. So we have to wrap our minds around management and what that means and what we are willing to do in order to preserve biodiversity. And these are going to be tougher and tougher decisions for us to make. And it's one of the reasons why I think these, these owls are so fascinating because we're at the verge of proposing some really crazy management options and we really just don't know what is the right thing to do. And I think it, this is going to be a time for all people um, to, to stand up and, and say what they think about these different management options and for all of us to think critically about biodiversity in the future and what that's going to mean. And so I want to thank now all of um, my different collaborators and folks that we work with in the field and the different funding um, sources that we've used. And, um, and I'd love to, to take any questions that, that people might have. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Jack. That was great. Um, so I see you have a couple uh, questions already from Peter Rutnery. Peter, are you still here? Do you want to come on and ask, um, go ahead and ask Jack some questions? Sure. Hey, Jack, that was wonderful. Hey, Peter, I really enjoyed that, as disturbing as, <laughs> as it was. I, I just had a, a couple of questions about the uh, sort of uh, dialect diet and ecology related, do you think that it's possible or to what extent would the broader, more generalist ecology, including the trophic ecology of the barred owl might subject it to less intense intra and interspecific competition and just simply allow it to pack itself in more comfortably into the same area that the spotted owls might be find themselves more constrained? Yeah, so if, if I'm understanding your question correctly, I, I think one of the things that the data are showing is that the, the barred owls prefer the same kinds of forests that spotted owls prefer. And when they're in those forests, they're eating a lot of the same kinds of things. Um, but they, but they will, um, but, but they, but because their diet's more general, they don't need as much land. And so they can pack themselves in a little bit more tightly. The right. other thing, yeah. And, Go ahead. Yeah. And the and the other thing that happens is that they can do quite well on on areas that have been logged over and that would be you know sub standard habitat for spotted owls and that allows them to continue cranking out young in areas where um, where spotted owls couldn't. So um, right. so both so of sort those of, <clears throat> sort of all things be. Uh, everything else being equal, then they do have, even without direct interaction, they might have this advantage over the spotted owls. Yeah, yeah, even without direct interaction. They, okay. they, then my, they uh, definitely second have that numerical. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my second related question then is how does all of this compare to ecology of the eastern barred owls? Are they also similarly gen generalists or no, do we yeah. know? Um, they are, yes, they're, they're much more generalist. And, and when you see them in the Eastern United States, they, they do feed, feed on crayfish and snails and insects and things. But, it, but again, the majority of their diet is small mammals, but they, but they do take a lot of these other, other kinds of things. Um, interestingly, a lot of the colleagues that I've talked to say, oh gosh, they are totally tame and, 
and not aggressive in the Eastern United States. So that might be part of their ad adaptation to the Western United States is becoming more aggressive. More aggressive. And, um, and, and oftentimes when, when species invade new areas, they, they move in slowly and, and you don't see a big uptick. And then many, many years, you know, goes by. And then all of a sudden you'll see this exponential growth. And a lot of people have, have, um, have talked about what that is and what happens during that period. And, and part of it may just be, you know, like they have this advantage, but they're, 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 they're case selected, if you will. But then, you know, in a totally open habitat, there should be selection for, for our, type selection for, you know, for our type reproduction. And so then those individuals that just become highly fecund um, can begin to spread. And then the population begins to spread because of that, you know, because of that adaptation to just becoming more and more fecund. And there's some, there's some really interesting data coming out of um, the Washington study sites showing that they appear to have to reach and pass their carrying capacity. And, and even where there are no barred owl removals taking place, Bar down numbers, numbers seem to be declining, but it seems to be because they overshot their carrying capacity. Um, and so, yeah. you know, so a lot of people are asking about, you know, what's going on and what's the nature of that, that delay. And, and, you know, has there been selection for being more aggressive and being more fecund? Yeah. But those are all still kind of open questions. Yeah. Yeah. Thank similar you. to a lot of other invasive species. Thanks, Jack. Mm -hmm. So Jack, I think you already touched on uh, the next question, um, but Shannon, why don't you go ahead? Oh, sorry, I was on mute. I thought Natalie might go first. Um, so I was just wondering, you, you showed that there's definitely a clear uh, differentiation in terms of SNPs between Western and Eastern. And maybe you touched on this, but did you do any statistical uh, tests with the genome information that you have on whether any of those SNPs reflect uh, adaptations? We we have done a little bit, and um, you, you see the very typical, you know, sort of um, sort of thing where you know you you. you you see hints of things that might be under selection, or at least they're outside the 95% or 99% confidence interval. Um, so, uh, and we do have a lot of information about what genes are there. So, so those are things that we'd like to dive a little bit deeper in. So we've identified some of those regions, but we have not had the opportunity to kind of dive in deeper. But, I'll, but I will say um, that we're collecting many, many more high coverage full genomes with the, with the help of Jeff Wall and his lab. And, Naoko Fujito is the one who's kind of spearheading some of that work, and she's a postdoc in, in his lab working with us. And um, and that and that particular paper um, that I cited is on BioArchive, and it's um, and there are a lot more analyses than I had time to talk about. But really, it, there's a lot in there that's exploring that eastern western barred owl split and what's really going on because I think that's also going to be critical to understand, you know. To, for, for managers to decide whether removals and, and management of Western barred owls is appropriate. Because if there really is a thing that's Western barred owls and they really are genetically distinct from Eastern barred owls, well, we might treat them very differently than we would if it's purely an invasion of Eastern barred owls. So these are, these are all things that we're trying to wrap our minds around and gather data to help answer these questions so that managers can make informed decisions. Cool, thank you. Uh, Natalie, sorry about that. I skipped you. You want to go ahead and ask a question? Yeah, that's fine. Um, thank you, Jack. That was really great. I learned a lot. Um, I was wondering if there has been any discussion uh, about ex situ conservation and if that's possible at all. Um, there hasn't really been yet because, you know, these are huge owls with with really, you know, intense needs. So So trying to keep a captive population of them would be um, very difficult, especially if you wanted to keep viable numbers of them. Um, so there hasn't really been much, much talk about that. One thing that folks have been doing is, is really trying to model um, what, the, what the habitat differences are. There was a really nice paper that just came out in December um, trying, trying to model that to, to see if, you know, and it's not exactly ex situ, but to see if we could manipulate the, in, the habitat for in order the, the the habitat in the western United States basically to see if we could tip the balance in favor of um, of spotted owls over barred owls and you know one one thing that's really important here to note is that 
nobody thinks that this is just barred owls. I think that, that there are ghosts of management past that we're dealing with. And we may have tipped the balance in favor of barred owls with all of the cutting and all of the removal of old growth forests. If we had forests that were in really great shape still, um, it may be a very different picture that we're seeing on the landscape than we are seeing right now. And one of the really big challenges is, is that for a redwood forest to become a mature redwood forest may take 400 years. And so even if we said, oh, this is what we need to do, we can manage the forests for this. It may be 400 years before those forests are really going to be a great habitat for, for spotted owls. So we've got to figure out some way to keep the spotted owl populations viable for that lag time, if you will until the forests can really support them. Um, and these are all, you know, and how much money that's gonna take and whether, is that really a priority for people in the post coronavirus world? These are all gonna be, you know, really tough decisions for, for people to wrestle with. There's another question uh, in the chat from uh, JP. JP, are you here? Do you wanna ask your question? Just have chat. Okay, hold on. Can you? Okay, chat away, JP. Can you see it, Jack? Do you want to read it? Um, let's see. Uh, Audubon climate change scenarios impacts on birds indicate southern habitats for spotted owl will become unsuitable for them in a few decades, leaving just the north. And the case for barred owl control and eradication throughout the range in the west, yeah, that's going to be a really big um, a really big challenge um, because as as the climate warms, a lot of the populations in the south are going to want to move north. But that northern habitat is is where there are already a lot of barred owls. So th that only complicates the situation, doesn't it? Um, it I, I I kind of alluded to this, but there's also another subspecies that's protected, the Mexican spotted owl, and they just live in these little forest sky islands across the desert southwest and all the birds in those areas are getting pushed off the top of the tops of the mountains as they're becoming more arid and warmer. And, um, and so those, those populations are in, in big trouble as well. And at least to date, barred owls haven't made it out to there, but that's something that may happen over time. So it's not helping. So I think that uh, is our last question. Oh, nope. Brian Simonson, you want to, Chime in, Brian Simonson. Yeah, so Brian asks, um, how can folks participate in your master birding course? So, so we are going um, online now. We're having to teach all that on, online. Um, you know, I haven't really thought about trying to just open that up because we have a pretty small group and, and there's a lot of stuff that they have to do. And in fact, just a shout out to some of our master birders. A lot of them are here. JP is one of our master birding students who joined us um, for this chat. So, um, um, but, um, I, if folks are interested in the master birding class, feel free to reach out to me by email and I can give you more information about it. Um, and it's a, it's a very intense year long. Um, we meet at least once a month and we go on a field trip, although those have all been canceled for the time being. Um, but we'd love to do more of those kinds of things, especially since, um, you know, online is one of our major formats right now. Thanks for that, Brian. And, th and thanks for all of our master birders, past and present, who've joined today. Thank you, Jack. I don't have a chat. This is Linda. <laughs> hey, Linda. <laughs> all right. I think uh, that's it. Thank you very much, Jack. That was wonderful. And Thank everyone, you. Uh, hopefully we'll see you all here next week for the next week's IBSS seminar. Thanks, everybody, for taking time out of your busy day to join. And